Do you sometimes wonder what equipment you need to function as a GP or in primary care? Well in this video I'm going to cover exactly that and show you what I use in my clinic on a daily basis. Let's tech enhance your primary care and learning. This is the first time we're meeting, I'm Dr Gandalf of VGP Learning where I look at supporting you with technology enhanced primary care and learning and in this video I'm going to show you all the kit that I keep in my clinical room that I use on a regular basis and also talk about some of the other things that you may want to consider as well. As always make sure you click subscribe and ring the bell to make sure you're notified first of all of our content and we're available on all the various platforms as usual. I'm always keen to hear your feedback so make sure you leave a comment as well. Shall we begin? So EGP learners, we're here in my clinical room to show you the kit that I use on a regular basis and what you may want to use as a GP or as a primary care worker. Whenever we think about doctors, the first thing we often think about is the stethoscope. Me, I use the standard Lipman version 2 that I've had since university. It's a reliable piece of kit that basically does the job. I have tried other versions and I know that one of the other favourites is the Cardiology Mark IV, which does give a slightly better sound you can evaluate whether or not the cost is worth it or not but there are alternative stethoscope brands as well so I have also got one of the MDF Acousta brands which is actually really good, really effective and considerably cheaper than the Littmans. If you wanted something slightly more high tech maybe worth considering Echo, a company that provides a Bluetooth attachment you can stick onto your stethoscope that actually allows you to enhance the sound so that it can help if you've got any hearing challenges but also allows you to pair it with a speaker so that the patients can hear and actually that could be a really useful tool sometimes to show them, or actually let them hear, effectively what you're hearing and therefore give a better kind of perspective in terms of your clinical diagnosis. There are even more fancier ones, things like the Think Lab one, Stethy, and if you really wanted to go fancy, um, Echo actually now do a combined stethoscope and ECG machine all in one. Yeah, I haven't gone that far yet, but who knows, time may tell. Next up, when we think about equipment, one of the standard pieces of kit that almost every GP should have is a diagnostic set. So this is a combined autoscope and ophthalmoscope. So this is my autoscope. I prefer the Welsh Allen brand, if I'm being honest. I've had this for, again, about nine years now since I started as a GP trainee. And um, this is the 9720, I believe, brand. Um, it, the reason why I like this one in particular is because it's got the macro view um, head for the autoscope, so it allows me to zoom in if I need to. Not often, but it does give slight better clarity, I can find the compared to the standard version. But more importantly, the ophthalmoscope head, it's also got the Kobo blue light. I know it's a tiny little thing and I probably have paid it overpaid compared to what you could do in terms of just getting a simple little blue light. But I like the fact that I can use that quickly and effectively when I'm checking for scars on the conjunctiva with fluorescein staining and things. So for me, that's the one I prefer. There are alternative versions, there are alternative brands, so Keeler and Wrights are a good brand as well. And you can get much cheaper kits, so I've got a much cheaper one in my home visiting bag that I have. Um, because, to be honest, I don't feel I need the same quality of equipment to that point. Yeah, I have a separate piece of kit for my bag, but we'll come to that later. If you had some money to burn, it may be worth considering the Panoptic version of the Welsh Allen kit. And basically that's the version that kind of looks a little bit like a mini bazooka, um, but allows you to completely occlude the eye when you're examining, so you can have a proper view of the uh, fundi and everything. Um, they're not cheap, you're talking 500 plus just for the head effectively, but they do give you considerably better image, and in particularly if you're a GP with a specialist in ophthalmology, it may be worth considering. In addition to standard otoscope kits, a lot of people are now looking at some of the newer digital versions, so you can get ones that you can either attach to your computer or even to your phone. So I actually have one here. This is a simple endoscope camera that I can use for patients. So, so with this, I can use a replaceable cap that we've got here. Put it on the tip. It still gives me a decent image. Um, I can show it on the computer. And then I can actually show the patient what's going on, for example, in their ears, whether or not they've got wax or whether it is a ball bearing that's actually in the ear. I have had that once, the patient didn't believe me and I literally had to show them. Thankfully I had this to do that and then they agreed that actually they had to go to A&E because unfortunately I couldn't get it out myself for them. Um, but using these kind of pieces of equipment can be really effective and also quite good if you're considering things like teledermatology or alternately 
Tele ENT, I think is the way it's going to be called. I don't know. But great way of sharing images with clinicians and specialists to get that quick answer. Is this actually a cholesteatoma or not, for example? Alternately, if you want to look at ones that aren't based around a desktop, there's a really good piece of kit called Cupris, um, which provides attachments so you can stick onto your smartphone, so Android and iPhone. And I believe they're also developing one as an Apple Amoscope that will be used soon. Um, so maybe worth considering those kind of pieces of equipment as well. One of the most important pieces of equipment I use on a regular basis, and particularly in winter, is the thermometer. Like many of you, you probably find this is a useful piece of kit. Duh. Um, but there are a variety of different ones you can use. For me, again, I prefer a particular brand, and it's the Braun brand that I use. So, like this. This is the one provided to me by my practice, but I must admit my personal preference is um, one called the 6020, just because it's quick to load, um, allows you to retake the temperature quickly without having to change the head, um, and it's the one I use at home, effectively. Um, there are alternative versions, and the Thermoscan 7 is a really good one if you're interested in having a bit more of indication. So, effectively, that gives you a color indicator for the high temperatures and stuff, and that's linked to age ranges as well. Alternatively, you can consider a no-touch thermometer. Um, so Braun do something called the BNT400, um, which is effectively a surface temperature checker. Um, they are good and they are effective, but they do have one caveat that you need to be aware of, although it saves the environment in terms of not having to use cap, plastic caps and things. The downside is that the patient has to be acclimatised before you can use them effectively. So if you've got a patient that's just rushed in from outside and it's been freezing cold, that may affect the surface temperature and therefore may affect the accuracy of the reading. Alternatively, if they're wrapped up warm like anything and they've been sat in the waiting room for quite a while and they're still wrapped up warm, their temperature may be obviously a lot higher than actually you would anticipate. Yeah, that can be the case with these as well in terms of the inner ear ones but it's a more noticeable difference with the surface temperature ones, so the accuracy of them may be slightly more affected. There's always this question about whether you use in-ear, um, axilla or oral thermometers. I think majority of people tend to prefer the inner ear just because of ease of convenience and ease of use. Um, axilla can be more effective and more accurate, particularly for the younger children, um, so always worth bearing that in mind. Next up, we've got the BP cough. Standard piece of equipment that many of us use. I've got a wall mounted one, and that's my preference if I'm being honest, because I do prefer manual blood pressure cuff. Um, the one that I've got here has the attached uh, larger cuff, again, Welsh Allen brand. Um, I do also have a portable one that I keep in my room here. Um, so this is a smaller cuff, so I use this if um, I've got a patient with smaller arms. Majority of my patient population, unfortunately, I end up having to use a larger cuff. But the other benefit of this is obviously if I've got a patient, for example, in a motorised wheelchair that can't get to this area of the room if quickly and effectively, means I can just pull this out and start using it. Obviously these are all calibrated on a regular basis um, and important to have the several sizes of cuffs. Um, I think you need two at the very least. don't have a paediatric cuff myself or I know I don't have the extra, extra large cuff myself, but the practice does if needed. One of the questions people always say, what about automated BP machines? Obviously they have the benefit that you can put them on the patient, press the button and do something in the minute or two it takes for that to get a decent reading. Personally, I prefer manual um, because I like to get a decent reading in that respect. Um, and also I tend to find sometimes the automatic ones over tighten, that kind of thing. Perfectly viable and definitely effective. So it's a personal preference if I'm being honest. Um, I don't know, why don't you guys tell me which one do you prefer? Do you prefer a manual cuff or an automated cuff? What do you think? I'd love to hear your comments. Leave them down below. Final kind of standard observation that we tend to do for majority of patients when we see them is the SATs. Now this is something that's come down from secondary care over time. You can argue how much value that they have, but in definite clinical situations they can be really valuable. Um, I've got this one by Anna Pulse. Um, it's a rather basic one if I'm being honest, so if you have a look at the dial, I'll bring that there for you. As you can see, fairly basic um, and not the best digital readout, I guess, compared to some of the newer versions that are out there. But the reason why I like this is that the specification of this is that it can be used in children over two, first of all, and it's one of the most accurate ones around. They have brought out some more recent ones which are more accurate, so this one has a plus or minus 2% um, variation for both pulse and for SATs. Um, compared to some of the more newer versions uh, which do have a 1%. So I must admit, um, when this dies I'm going to be upgrading and actually I tend to upgrade these on an annual basis because it, it offsets the issues with the warranty and that kind of thing. It's a small cost in my view. Um, the battery life is amazing on these things though, so useful in that respect. Some of you may have the more larger pieces ones and, and the, the kind of like the more medically looking ones. 
Um, I've, I check these on a regular basis compared to the one we have in practice and I get the same readings which is useful and valuable. However, obviously this doesn't check under two so I do have to use the practice one in that situation. So that's the majority of the kit that I think many of us would use on a regular basis. There are some other things that obviously many of us would have. So other things I would recommend most people have. Tape measure, um, handy to have in terms of measuring for DVTs or leg lengths and that kind of thing. Um, tendon hammer, yes we do check reflexes. I know some patients think we don't, but we do. Um, I love this one, although it's a drug grip one that I have had for ages. The reason why I love it, it's got the little mission um, thing for diabetic foot checks and stuff. So handy little thing. Um, Tuning fork, as well as heat flow meters, both adult and child versions, and make sure they're checked on a regular basis. As always, all the equipment you should have should be calibrated on a regular basis. It's important to remember that happens. If you're in a practice, the practice should take care of that themselves. If you're a locum, it would be worth having a good relationship with practice to make sure that they will allow you that to happen for you quickly and effectively. So worth contacting them to make sure your kit is kept calibrated and therefore validated. Um, other kind of equipment that sometimes people ask me about um, is the more tech kind of things and there are a variety of different pieces of equipment that you can consider. Some of you may have seen my video about the Alive Core Cardia that I've got here. So I use this on a regular basis and um, with patients to screen for AF. Important thing that you need with this is either one of these, a smartphone, or a tablet that you can use quickly and effectively to get the information from this to show to the patient and to use clinically as well. And as some of you know, I also have that tablet in the background, so I use that with patients, particularly for near patient testing and feedback. So I'll actually ask them sometimes to fill in questionnaires, particularly useful for your PSQ, especially if you don't want to pump out for the printing of those kind of documents. But also it's useful for showing patients things like apps and that kind of thing, um, as well as using with these kind of pieces of equipment and, and stuff. Near patient testing is growing area of medicine and we're going to see more of this come down particularly as we try and move away from secondary care based care. Um, one thing that I'm currently trialling in practice is something called a Febri DX. This is one of the versions of um, near patient testing for CRP. Um, this also checks for other markers. We're currently doing a trial of this. I must admit so far it's been quite significant the effect it's had on patients. Whether it's cost effective or not, that part I'm still trying to evaluate and things. Worth having a look though, so I'll, I'll let you guys know what I think about that in due time. That's pretty much all the clinical equipment I keep in my room. Um, there's obviously a variety of other things that we keep as a regular basis, so you know, stationery, pens, blah blah blah, all that kind of stuff. A couple of things, however, I would always recommend every clinician considers keeping. So, number one, an extra pair of clothes. If you work in a practice on a regular basis, it's handy to have an extra pair of clothes, particularly if it's a bad day, you might want an extra jumper or something but keeping that is always valuable. Additionally, if you have a regular room, make sure that you're comfortable in that room is paramount. So again, many of you know I've got my standing desk that I use to make sure that I've got good posture and that kind of stuff as best as I can. In addition, one of my favorite things is my mouse rest. A little piece of kit called an iMac beads. Um, so nice little stress relief at times. Yeah, really just, yeah. It's good and handy, but it's a great wrist rest, I must admit. Um, I used to get quite significant problems with carpal tunnel. Since I've had this, it's significantly improved, along with my wrist pad that I have down below. Um, making sure you've got good ergonomic systems. So I've got a mouse um, that's angled to make sure that it improves my wrist quality, um, and a variety of other things. So make sure you've got the right equipment for yourself is always important. I also keep a water bottle with me. It's important to be hydrated particularly in the work that we do, you make it several hours without realising you've even had a drink and things, so make sure you've got one in the clinical room. My personal preference is a Camelback, um, I've currently using the Systema one because someone's nabbed my Camelback in practice, not happy, um, but that'll get replaced shortly. Last little thing I recommend people keep, it's a bit cheesy I know, but some stickers, um, great for the kids. Alternatively you can use is tongue depressors, so you can use those instead of using stickers and that kind of stuff, um, so I tend to draw on them when I've run out. And, uh, thankfully I've got a new supply so that's going to last me probably several years if I'm being honest. Um, but yeah, handy and nice to have with the, with the children and stuff, particularly since we're not allowed to keep toys and that kind of stuff in the rooms anymore, because I do not plan on doing going down the cleaning routine that CQC insists upon us. If you want to check out any of the equipment discussed in this video, then make sure you check the show notes. There'll be links to all of the equipment that I've discussed and more. Um, for example, like this box that I've got here. For example, like this box that I keep all my equipment in. Feel free to check that out if you want.
If you want to check out any of the equipment that I've discussed in this video, make sure you check the show notes. All the links will be there and that will take you through. There are small affiliate links with some of them, um, in which means I basically get a small commission if you click on the links, but that's to pay for the work that I do here and it's at no extra cost for you guys. It's your choice. If not, feel free to search for them independently. I hope that's helpful to you all. So guys, that's the variety of kit and equipment I tend to keep in my room. There's obviously other kind of things that many of you will also keep. Obviously I haven't covered things like the medications, drugs that you may keep in emergencies and that kind of stuff because, to be fair, we don't have time. Um, but that, that's obviously worth being aware of, as well as other kind of things like sharp boxes and all that kind of stuff that should be provided in your clinical room anyway. I'd be keen to know what you guys think about the equipment I've covered and whether you think I've missed anything. Yeah, okay, fair enough, computer is a pretty obvious one, I haven't talked about that. But anything else that you know you guys think that should be included in your room. Um, and make sure if you do, leave me a comment to let me know about that, so either down below. As always, we're available on all the various platforms, so we're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and obviously on the podcast, and definitely the YouTube platform. I'm always keen to hear your feedback, positive or negative, really keen to know what you guys think. Please make sure you subscribe to get all of our content first and foremost. Want to make sure you get all this stuff as quickly as possible. And always, guys, make sure you keep saving yours and your patient's time by tech enhancing your primary care and learning. Catch you in the next video.